Welcome everyone. We'll just give one minute for a couple more people to come on. Okay, I think we're good. Hello and welcome to the Harvest Plus Sasakawa Africa Association side event for the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit 2021 entitled Biofortified Crops, a Practical, Scalable, Nutrition Sensitive Solution for Smallholder Farmers. I'm Peter Goldstein, Head of Strategic Communications at Harvest Plus, and I will be moderating this event. During the event, you may submit questions in the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And if you like, you can also specify which speaker to address your question to. If we can't get your question during the session, we will respond by email afterwards. There's also a translation uh, button available at the bottom of the screen for translation into Japanese. For our speakers who have slides, we will advance the slides for you, so please say next slide when you would like the slide to advance. Note that there will likely be a slight time lag for changing the slides, so please be a little bit patient with us. Just to start off, uh, for those who may not be familiar, biofortification is the process of breeding common staples such as rice, wheat, beans, maize, and cassava to be naturally rich in essential micronutrients, particularly iron, zinc, and vitamin A. There's now hundreds of varieties of these biofortified crops available in about 40 countries, and those were bred using conventional crop breeding methods, not through genetic modification, although that is possible. Um, it is a response to widespread micronutrient deficiency, which is known as hidden hunger, in many low and middle income countries around the world, which is causing serious health and developmental problems holding back people as well as their countries. It is a nutrition response that's really geared primarily towards smallholder farming families who typically cannot afford or access nutritionally diverse diets. And with the, starting, the summit starting tomorrow, we're very excited about the opportunity today to inform this high level event with our distinguished lineup of speakers and panelists. We will seek to identify what key stakeholders, such as governments, businesses, and funders, can do to ensure that this proven, practical, cost-effective, and complementary nutrition strategy benefits millions of more people. And I should note as well that several of our speakers today are from Nigeria or based there, and one in five Sub-Saharan Africans live in Nigeria, uh, making it a very important country on the continent. We'll be looking at that country as a kind of case study example of how we can scale up biofortification. During the concluding segment, we'll also hear from the leaders of the Sasakawa Africa Association and Harvest Plus about a new partnership between the two organizations to help accelerate this scale up in Africa based on a common approach for full agricultural value chain to create sustainable results for smallholder farmers, while also supporting policy advocacy to catalyze enabling environments at the national level. So with that, I'm gonna to turn to our first speaker, who is Mr. Yohei Sasakawa, who's the chairperson of the Nippon Foundation, which is the primary funder of the Sasakawa Africa Association. The SAA itself was formed in 1986 in collaboration between the foundation, Dr. Norman Borlaug, known as the father of the Green Revolution, and former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Sasakawa was not able to join us in person today, but he has provided a welcome video. Why don't we go ahead with the video? Thanks. Mr. Olusegun Obasanjo, former president of Nigeria. Mr. Arun Balala, Harvest Plus CEO. Sasakawa Africa Association Chair, Dr. Ruth Onyang, and Vice Chair, Dr. Amit Roy, and agriculture researchers and extension workers. I'd like to first pay my respect to your endless effort in achieving food security and positive nutrition in the developing countries through agriculture. 
I would also like to express my gratitude for having been given this opportunity to address you today at this gathering. One world, one family. This is the fundamental philosophy of the Nippon Foundation. It is a core of our humanitarian activities across the boundaries of politics, religion, race, and national borders. Sasakawa Africa Association was and is no exception. The year was 1984 when a great famine was declared in Ethiopia. More than a million people, including women and children, suffered extreme famine. Seeing this, my late father, Ryoichi Sasakawa, together with the Nobel laureate, Dr. Norman Borok, and former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, established SAA in 1986 to provide humanitarian assistance. Africa at that time was facing chronic food shortage. Temporary emergency food aid alone would not have solved the underlying cause. In order that no child would ever go to bed hungry, SAA took its assistance to the farmers. Through increased food production, smallholder farmers, who are the mainstay of agriculture in Africa, would become independent and improve their livelihood. Yet, in retrospect, 35 years of history was not in any way a smooth road. SAA has faced many difficult problems. However, each challenge was overcome with the spirit of never giving up. As a result of having worked on hand in hand with the farmers, Tremendous improvement in food production has been achieved. Having come this far, SAA is once again ready to direct its focus for further development of agriculture in Africa. It has now placed nutrition sensitive agriculture as one of the three major pillars of its activities. Until now, the major goal was to improve food productivity to end hunger. But with the current strategic plan, I firmly believe that it will be possible to improve the growth and development of children and to maintain the health of the farming communities. I am very happy that such undertakings of SAA have led to the conclusion of partnership agreement with Harvest Plus. I would invite full cooperation from the expert present today and hope that together we will achieve the realization of Africa filled with hope. Thank you. The old music. you are muted. What are you saying? I'm sorry, I was muted. I will start again. Um, <laughs> <laughs>
I am introducing uh, Ms. Ruth Onyango, who is the chair of the Susquehanna Africa Association and also a true African nutrition legend in her own right. Um, she is the uh, 2017 uh, Africa Food Prize laureate. Um, she has been a leader in outreach and work with smallholder farmers in Kenya, particularly through her work with the Rural Outreach Program. She's also a former parliamentarian of Kenya. Um, and we're very happy to, to have her join uh, with us today. Uh, please go ahead, Minamo Diango. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter Gostein, for uh, agreeing to moderate this. And uh, I'm very happy to join. Uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, our keynote speaker for today, former president of Nigeria, uh, His Excellency Olusegun Obasanjo. Uh, by the way, who has been a board member of Sasakawa Africa Association in the past. And also want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Yohe Sasakawa, who has supported us, uh, taking over from his father, Roichi Sasakawa, who died in 1995. And we have never missed funding as SAA for the last 35 years. Let me also acknowledge uh, the panelists who are here uh, very well uh, accomplished in their own rights, and you'll be hearing from them. Uh, all the people connected to Harvest Plus and to SAA and friends of the organizations and friends of Africa and friends of nutrition. I just want to thank you all for actually joining this August session. This meeting has been long, long coming. This collaboration has been long coming because when I joined SAA board in 2009, a month before uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Bollock died, uh, it was like we sh I should help address the issue of maternal and uh, child health and nutrition. Uh, uh, but uh, all along, uh, SAA has been interested in nutrition, but just couldn't figure out how to do it. And so uh, Harvest Plus having come along and I served on their very first program advisory committee way, way back uh, when Howdy was uh, spearheading this organization. And I'm just so happy, so happy that the two organizations are coming together and coming together on our 35th anniversary as SAA. So I think it's time for nutrition. You know, it's time for nutrition, following sustainable development goals, which we are just still talking about hunger and productivity and quantity. But now with the UN Food Systems Summit, we've seen that we have to address the whole food systems. And we have to address the issue of quantity, quality, micronutrients, at the same time, food safety. And the issue of food safety is so critical. I always say uh, unsafe food is no food at all. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our, our, our personnel, you know, who have worked with us all through. And SAA is a very special organization. You know, we have headquarters in Tokyo. We have regional headquarters in Addis. And we have offices. Uh, we have had offices in Europe, in London Communications. We have had offices in Washington, D.C. and in, at the Qatar Center. So we've had offices all over. You know, we have connections with Mexico in a big way, supporting capacity building there, but also with the CIMIT, you know, where Dr. Bolog worked for so many years. Uh, and personally, I felt extremely privileged to have been associated with this organization. It has helped me see many other African countries and what is done there. Have and come to understand what smallholder farmers go through, especially the women. And we now see opportunities, not just for the women, for the youth as well, and for everybody to really be concerned about food security and nutrition. And so uh, the, this meeting coming on the, on the heels of the uh, 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 Nutrition for Growth Summit, uh, the Tokyo one, which we were supposed uh, to attend physically, <laughs> But now we're attending virtually. Uh, I think uh, uh, our event uh, is coming, a side event is coming at the, just the right time to inform. Uh, and many times people have not understood. I've seen even when I, I published, you know, at one time I had an issue publishing and someone 
misunderstood. You know, these are top scientists. They misunderstood the difference between fortification and biofortification. And so uh, uh, it's good that uh, our moderator, uh, Dr. Goldstein, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very much defined that how we get uh, micronutrients into the normal staples we consume, you know, but naturally, naturally, so that uh, people don't have to worry. And it just means nutrition for all. But of course, we worry about the vulnerable groups, but I can just see that it's just good nutrition for everyone. Our challenge, therefore, then is how do we get governments to adopt this to a large extent? And like you said, you know, every fifth African is Nigerian, but there are so many of us who are not Nigerian <laughs> who need to actually make sure that our nutrition is, is properly uh, addressed in our various countries. And, you know, Africa has 54 countries, sovereign states, and each one has to deal with its own issues. I wish we could do this collectively. So let me just invite uh, everyone and to just say thank you. And as, as SAA, uh, we can just assure you that uh, the way we operate with our uh, Japanese funders is a partnership. It's a partnership. Uh, that's who the Japanese are. They are funded us for 35 years nonstop. And I, I, we just need donors We really care about getting rid of this uh, scourge of malnutrition, uh, of hunger, uh, that they, they look at long-term funding uh, and making sure that you capacity build the people who are supposed to spearhead this within the countries themselves. Uh, and, and as you know, the sustainable development goal number 17 is partnerships. And I, I think that is so critical and we should Think of that as we move forward. So let me just wish all of us a great 35 years celebration for SAA and a great partnership uh, going forward. And Howdy, I told you, you were great an award. And you went and got that World Food Prize. I was so happy for you. And you are still here. And I'm sure you are happy to see biofortification go forward and to also to partner with us. And uh, I'm happy also to have Dr. Amit Roy, who is uh, vice chair uh, to me at SAA and who is also on the board of, uh, of Harvest Plus. So welcome everyone and uh, let's move forward and enjoy this session. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome. Uh, Madam Unyango, I wonder if I could just put you on the spot for a minute um, and ask you a question. Uh, obviously, as a former parliamentarian, obviously in the government, with a lot of experience uh, dealing with uh, government, and you mentioned, of course, the importance of uh, government's uh, backing, uh, what we're trying to do here in terms of improving nutrition for smallholders. I wondered if you could just comment very quickly, uh, um, what, what, how do we, you know, what is the best way to, to generate that interest? Um, what, it, what are the challenges and opportunities to, to engage uh, senior uh, officials in governments to, to make sure that we get that kind of backing? Thank you very much. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Peter. You know, actually, I've uh, found out that um, uh, biofortification is not viewed the same way GMOs are. Like in Kenya already, we are promoting uh, zinc and, and, and iron rich uh, beans uh, in other countries as well, Rwanda, you know, I've seen that going on. Uh, and I think the best way is to make sure you meet parliamentarians who are concerned with this matter, maybe committee on agriculture, committee on environment as well and trade and begin to engage them to understand why, what biofortification is. That's the best way you start from there. And as I said already, if we can do trials with farmers, you know, doing demonstrations with them, because the regulations, at least in Kenya, they are not as strict as they are in, in uh, regarding GMO. So that's the best way to go. Thank you. And by the way, to make seed available, Peter, it's no point telling people plant this and use this and the seed, good planting material is not available. And investing, in uh, making sure that you get to those smallholder farmers and you for the for farmers seeing is believing seeing is believing yes 
Exactly. Seeing is believing. And we're going to get to that later, particularly in terms of seeds availability and all that. Um, but before we do so, um, we are honored to have, as you mentioned, a, uh, a video from His Excellency President Olusegun Obasanjo. Uh, as some of you know, he was the president of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. Uh, he oversaw his country's first democratic handover of power. Um, he also, at the African level, helped establish the New Partnership for Africans, Africa's Development, or NEPOD. And he has also been a very active international peace mediator in many parts of Africa. Um, and we're very honored uh, to have him join us uh, today uh, by video. Unfortunately, he's not able to join us in person. Um, but why don't we go ahead with the video now from President Obasanjo. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the global community is facing a number of serious challenges, including climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, rapid population growth, persistent youth unemployment, and environmental issues such as soil degradation. Smallholder farmer families are among those most vulnerable to the impacts of these challenges. It is therefore critical to improve the food, nutrition, and income security of small older families by creating resilient and sustainable food systems in low and middle income countries. In Africa, poverty related factors, food insecurity and infectious diseases persist, while drought, floods and protracted humanitarian crises continue to increase the double burden of malnutrition. Of 34 countries that account for 90% of the global burden of malnutrition, 22 are in Africa. The prevalence of vitamin A and iodine deficiencies, inadequate zinc intake, and iron deficiency anemia is highest in Africa compared to the rest of the world. The number of undernourished people in sub-Saharan Africa rose from 181 million in 2010 to 2 39 million in 2018, with a prevalence of 20.8%, albeit partly reflecting an increased population. Most of the world's stunted and wasted children are found in Africa and Asia. Globally, there are 149 million stunted children under the ages, age of five, a figure that has fallen over time. However, in Africa, the number of stunted children have been rising steadily over time and reached 58.8 million in 2018. In the same year, nearly 50 million children under the age of five, representing 7.3% of the total, suffered from moderate to severe wasting worldwide. In Africa, the number was 14 million, representing 7.1% of children. Meanwhile, 
Obesity is now recognized as one of the most important public health burdens facing the world today. 40.1 million children under the age of five were overweight by 2018. Of these, 9.5 million children are in Africa. One of the underlying causes is the commercialization of food production, processing, and distribution, which is correlated with a decreasing number of smallholder farming families, poor dietary diversity, and increasing household dependence on purchased food. The increasing consumption of processed food and reduced physical activity are among the key drivers of this increasing double burden of malnutrition in Africa. The negative effects of low agricultural productivity also prevent communities from achieving their full potential because it makes them predisposed to poverty and malnutrition. The resulting lack of essential micronutrients in their diets leads to high rates of stunting, anemia, blindness, weakened immune system, and vulnerability to diarrhea and other infections, as well as physical and cognitive developmental impairments for children and adolescents. The recent UN Food System Summit aimed to fast track the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals with a key element being food system transformation. The Sustainable Development Goals aim to end all forms of hunger and malnutrition by 2030, making sure all people, especially children, have sufficient and nutritious food all the year round. The Nutrition for Growth Summit builds on the results of the recent UN Food Systems Summit, which identified ending hunger and malnutrition as one of the priority actions for investment, finance, and trade. Improving nutrition through agriculture is a necessary and proven response to the global nutrition challenge. It is a holistic approach that combines nutrition-sensitive agriculture with regenerative and market-oriented approaches in a complementary manner. A priority goal for food systems transformation is to make healthy diets accessible and affordable to all people, regardless of demographics, income level, or location. Vulnerable smallholder farming families in rural areas of Africa, Asia, and Latin America depend on agriculture for their diets and their livelihoods. They are strongly represented among the estimated 3 billion people worldwide who cannot afford diverse healthy diets. The concept of delivering essential vitamins and minerals 
through nutri nutrient dense staple food and crops, an approach known as biofortification is a highly cost effective way of addressing micronutrient deficiency among these smallholder farming communities. The process of biofortification has gained considerable traction in low and middle income countries since the first varieties were released to farmers 16 years ago. There are now nearly 400 biofortified crop varieties of 11 common staples available in over 40 countries, reaching about 10 million farming families. But this barely scratches the surface of the need for them among rural communities. This proven practical, cost efficient, and complementary nutrition response is ready for rapid scale up to help achieve the global nutrition targets, objectives, and commitments. The Copenhagen Consensus, a leading global development think tank, ranks biofortification along with other food-based approaches and interventions that reduce micronutrient deficiency among the highest value for money investments for economic development. It is thus imperative to scale up nutrient-dense crops and biofortification to help contribute to achieving several sustainable development goals. Endorsements and new commitments by national governments, multi-sectoral organizations addressing the nutri nutrition sector, the private sector, donors, and global institutions are needed to mainstream biofortification within crop and food systems and make these crops readily accessible to smallholder farming communities. We need integrated efforts that strengthen each node of the agriculture value chain from seed to plate. We need to prioritize our fortified crops in tackling malnutrition and hidden hunger through policy interventions and funding commitments that strengthen innovative technology development, delivery approaches, and capacity enhancement. For example, here in my country, Nigeria, the federal government and several state governments have made strong commitments to scaling up our fortification to benefit the country's more than 38 million smallholder farming families. Through integration of biofortification in policies and promotion of biofortified crops in seed and food value chains, the benefits of these nutritious varieties are reaching many more farming families and consumers. It is a model 
for other countries to follow. I urge the stakeholders and donors participating in this Nutrition for Growth Summit to prioritize investments and policy commitments, ensuring that the global community can reach the global targets to reduce the prevalence of stunting, wasting, anemia in women, and prevalence of low birth weight with additional focus on ending poverty and addressing inequalities. This requires international cooperation to ensure investments that include training and support for relevant stakeholders on sustainable agricultural practices, processing and consumption of nutritious crops, agreed business and on food diversification and gender sensitive awareness racing on nutrition. Bio fortified crops should play a key role in efforts to foster a healthier and more productive global community. Thank you for listening. Great, that was fantastic. And of course, um, we want to recognize uh, former President Obasanjo as a, as a very uh, big uh, champion for biofortification in Nigeria. I think he did a very good job of underlining what the uh, nutrition challenges that were faced, uh, particularly among smallholder farmers. And uh, the objective of biofortification to really make sure that better nutrition is in the hands of those smallholder farmers and that they control it and it's in the foods. Um, we had uh, hoped that our next speaker would be um, Ms. Essie, Ms. Mrs. Essie Omoafel, who is the Director of Nutrition of the Ghana Health Service, who is going to talk a little bit more about the trouble uh, connecting to us. Hopefully, she can join us later. Um, so we're going to turn now, if uh, Howdy Buis is available, to uh, Howdy Buis, who is um, was the founding director of Harvest Plus, sort of known as the father of, of biofortification. He was also the recipient, uh, co-recipient co in 2016 of the World Food Prize in recognition of that work. Um, he also chairs the Board of Trustees of the Micronutrient Forum. And regarding Africa, he was named a nutrition champion by the African Leaders for Nutrition, which is a joint initiative of the African Development Bank and the African Union to promote high level engagement and advance the nutrition agenda. Uh, welcome, Howdy. Uh, go ahead. Okay, great to be here. I'd like to thank Ruth for her kind words at the opening. And I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today to give you an overview of the Harvest Plus experience. I'm speaking to you from our home in Los Banos, Philippines, which is where the University of the Philippines premier agricultural university is. And it's also the home of the International Rice Research Institute. So if I could have the next slide. There is no one strategy that will solve the problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. A mix of strategies is required. Each has its own particular comparative advantages and drawbacks. Some can be implemented relatively quickly, which relieves current untold suffering, but these tend to be more expensive. Are governments willing to maintain recurrent expenditures year after year for shorter term strategies? Agricultural strategies are lower cost, but take longer to implement. A theme that I will return to later is whether policymakers have the patience and perseverance to pursue longer term strategies 
that avoid the same recurrent costs year after year and are more resilient and sustainable. Next slide, please. When the issue of mineral and vitamin deficiencies was first recognized, the nutrition community began with programs to provide supplements and food fortification, which filled the gaps but did not directly treat the underlying problem of poor quality diets. For example, 10 billion with a B, vitamin A supplements have been given out over the past 20 years to preschool children, saving millions of lives. The cost is one to two dollars per supplement. Countries must continue to spend year after year for supplements and food fortification. Next slide, please. This simple stylistic diagram makes the point that it is much more cost effective and sustainable for agriculture to supply a higher percentage of the minerals and vitamins that people need at affordable prices as represented by the green shaded portion of the rectangles, which represent total mineral and vitamin requirements. Initially, the nutrition community was focused on filling the yellow gap in the diagram, not growing the green supply of nutrients from agriculture. Next slide, please. As we look to the future, we can break down the specific activities to be undertaken within agriculture into two broad groups. First, those activities which focus on food staples, which must increase the density of minerals and vitamins. Consumers already eat maximum amount of food staples. Second, those activities which focus on non-staple foods must seek to increase the quantities eaten. Fundamentally, the second strategy is only possible if incomes can be increased and food prices can be lowered. Both broad strategies need to be pursued simultaneously. Next slide, please. I have heard some people say that food staples lack minerals and vitamins. This is not at all an accurate statement. Lack is not the right term. Rather, food staples are not dense in minerals and vitamins. The absolute intake of minerals and vitamins from food staples is the result of multiplying quantities consumed times the density. The first term in this multiplication, quantities consumed of food staples is a high number. Thus, as this slide shows, milled rice in the Philippines provides a very significant proportion of a wide range of minerals and vitamins in diets. In fact, no single food in the Philippines provides more minerals and vitamins than rice. Food staples actually are an important source of minerals and vitamins in the diets of the poor. The objective then within the substrategy of focusing on food staples is to increase densities. Next slide. I myself have worked for more than 25 years to promote and implement a strategy of biofortification through plant breeding. This picture shows a deep orange maize developed through conventional plant breeding, which is high in vitamin A. Africans eat white maize, which has no vitamin A. But vitamin A deficiency is widespread in Africa. The orange mazes are high yielding and sell for the same price as white maize. Getting Africans to substitute orange maize for white maize in their diets will go a long way toward eliminating vitamin A deficiency at no extra cost to consumers. Next slide. Several types of biofortified crops are now released in 40 countries and are in testing for release in more than 20 additional countries. Some crops have more iron, some crops have more zinc, some have more vitamin A. Next slide. This map simply shows the 63 countries where releases already have been approved or are in testing for release. 
Biofortification is truly a global activity. Next slide. You cannot read the detail in this chart, which is available on the Harvest Plus website, and which shows which crops are released or are in testing in all 63 countries. The statistics include orange sweet potato varieties developed and disseminated through the International Potato Center, which is not part of Harvest Plus. Presentations to follow will provide specific information on biofortified crop varieties. Next slide, please. This is an older map which tries to convey all of the previous detail in one slide. Nearly 400 biofortified crop varieties have been released in low and middle income countries. Biofortified crops are being grown by a minimum estimate of 12 million farm households globally. Harvest Plus now is striving to make the numbers of producers and consumers of biofortified crops much higher in the hundreds of millions. Next slide. It is important to note that there is a wealth of evidence now in the nutrition literature that increasing the density of vitamin A, iron and zinc in food staples improves micronutrient status and demonstrates even that functional outcomes are improved, such as less sickness and better cognitive and work performance. Next slide, please. Turning now to scaling up, Harvest Plus works with collaborating organizations all along food value chains to ensure consumer demand and markets for farmers who produce biofortified crops. Next slide. Let me provide one example from Africa and one example from Asia. I start with iron beans in Rwanda. Several varieties of high yielding bean varieties were released in Rwanda by 2012. It is important to have initial funding to prime the pump as it were, to multiply seed, to set up demonstration plots and provide opportunities for farmers to purchase seed. This slide shows the locations you can see all over Rwanda where different types of activities were undertaken to induce farmers to experiment with growing high iron seeds. Next slide. The iron bean varieties have been popular due to the high yields based on the best agronomic properties coming out of the bean breeding program at SIAP, the CGIR center, which was the Harvest Plus partner working on bean breeding. Harvest Plus undertook nationally representative farm surveys in 2015. The iron climber beans were 21% higher yielding and the iron bush beans were 17% higher yielding. Harvest Plus estimates presently that iron beans account for a minimum of 20% of bean production in Rwanda. Why wouldn't these high yielding varieties spread? Next slide. Moving over to India, the idea of breeding for biofortified crop varieties has become mainstreamed within the system of agricultural research institutes. This is a brochure published by the Indian Council for Agricultural Research, which describes the agronomic and nutritional properties of 78 released biofortified varieties across 12 types of crops, one page per variety. Several of these varieties are high zinc wheats. Harvest Plus estimates that 550,000 farm households in India now grow zinc wheat. Next slide. As part of the process of, for advocacy, Efficacy trials already mentioned previously are undertaken to show rigorous scientific evidence of health benefits. Mothers and their children who consumed zinc weed in this study undertaken near Delhi had fewer episodes of illness than mothers and children who consumed the regular non biofortified wheat. Next slide. In a speech on the occasion of World Food Day, October 16th last year, 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi dedicated 17 biofortified varieties of eight crops to the nation to celebrate establishment of the Food and Agricultural Organization in 1945, the 75th anniversary of FAO. According to Indian media reports, the national government intends to scale up production of biofortified crop varieties and integrate them in government support programs, such as midday meals for school children to reach the most vulnerable populations. Next slide. I turn now to vegetables, fruits, pulses, animal products, those foods which are, are already dense in minerals and vitamins. In my opinion, the fundamental strategy should be to increase the supply of specific key foods that can contribute importantly to nutrient intakes where supply can be increased cost effectively through public policy and investments. There are two fundamental points to make. First, the primary objective is to lower the price of these specific foods. Second, these specific foods will vary greatly by country depending on dietary patterns. Next slide. Let me make a few final comments on the resolve or lack thereof of agricultural policymakers to work with the nutrition community on reducing malnutrition and improving health. First, let me make the quick point that focusing on staple foods offers advantages under the COVID pandemic. Dietary quality is worsening as incomes fall. There is a continued high levels of consumption of food staples, of course, and a government focus on ensuring food staple supplies. Food staple approaches to increasing density offers extra minerals and vitamins at diets at no extra cost to consumers. Apart from the short run concerns about COVID, to address malnutrition, we need a mix of all approaches, short run nutrition direct, such as supplementation and commercial fortification and long run nutrition smart interventions that treat the underlying causes and make the foundation of food systems more nutritious. It is a matter of finding leaders and champions for each individual approach and persevering. We need to bring in more funding under the overall nutrition umbrella. Next slide, please. Although they are cost efficient, sustainable and resilient, a drawback to agricultural approaches are the long gestation periods. It takes many years, often decades, to have large scale impacts globally. As parents, we invest in our children's education over 20 years. Can policymakers and donors take the same long-term perspective with agriculture? The long-term payoffs are very high. Agricultural policymakers are accustomed to focusing on increasing agricultural productivity and rural incomes, reducing poverty. Asking them also to give priority to a nutrition lens is a relatively new idea. Some Brock Progress has been made, which might be discussed in the question and answer period. It is important to have positive examples to show, which can incentivize further momentum. Next slide, please. In closing, let me read this quote, which has inspired me over many years. Such intimately related subjects as agriculture, food, nutrition, and health have become split up into innumerable rigid and self-contained little units, each in the hands of some group of specialists. The experts soon find themselves learning more and more about less and less. The remedy is to look at the whole field covered by crop production, animal husbandry, food, nutrition, and health as one related subject and to realize that the birthright of every crop, every animal, and every human being is health. Next slide. This, this quote sounds very contemporary, but it was written in 1945. These ideas and concepts, broadly speaking, have been around for a long time, but it takes leadership and perseverance to put them into practice. 
Next slide. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the discussion to follow. Thank you very much, Howdy. And I think you, you know, uh, as part of your presentation, the examples from Rwanda and India really show what can get done if there is a very strong level of commitment. Um, and it has to be uh, multi-sectoral, and it has to be among many different parts of the government. Um, I just have a very quick question for you that's come in, and we'll we'll do it very quickly because we're a little bit behind schedule. But someone okay. wanted to know uh, how, in a nutshell, how do we decide which biofortified crops will be introduced in which in which country? Wondered if you could give us a quick response to that. Thank well, the main the main criteria is you you go after the main food staple. If you're um, if you're in northern India, it's probably wheat. If you're in southern India, it's going to be rice. And then uh, there are areas in between where they grow both rice and wheat. So you're you're really focusing on whatever the main food staple is, and that's that's the one that you want to replace one for one. The non-biofortified for the biofortified, you'll have the largest impact that way. Great, thank you very much. Okay, without further ado, I think uh, we have been. I think. Uh, Ms. Anwafel is still, she was here, now she's gone again. So I'm going to switch over to uh, Mel Luke. Um, just one second here. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Um, who's the regional director uh, for the Sasakawa Africa Association. Um, and he's going to tell us about what SAA has been doing in Africa to try to support smallholder farmers and how nutrition will fit into their program. Please go ahead, Mel. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for this opportunity to uh, be able to bring into perspective what we do at Sasaka Africa Association. And I also uh, wish to thank uh, uh, Howdy for that insightful presentation. And uh, uh, Howdy is my mentor in biofortification. Everything I know about biofortified crops, I learned from Howdy. So it's uh, good to be here again in this forum and uh, listen to that insightful presentation. Now, uh, we want to bring in an uh, overview of what uh, SAA is doing uh, to be able to promote uh, agriculture-based uh, community nutrition approach. Next. <clears throat> Well, uh, Sisaka Africa Association was founded in 1986, as has been said before, and together with the Qatar Center's Global 2000 program, which uh, was merged together to have an operational uh, 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 entity, which has been known as Sisaka Global 2000 until the uh, beginning of this year when it was merged into the larger Sasakao Africa Association. And uh, we've been operating in 16 countries in Africa, currently focusing in 11 countries, with country offices in Ethiopia, Nigeria, Mali, and Uganda, with the headquarters in Tokyo, and the regional office based in Addis Ababa, where I am right now. Next. <clears throat> the Sasaka Africa Association has gone through a lot of uh, 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 experience in scaling up uh, agriculture technologies. We are an extension organization where we engage in agriculture technology transfer, working together with the Ministry of Agriculture and many other partners to be able to realize an agriculture transformation with a specific focus in Africa. Well, our new strategic plan is, has been developed from starting this year to be able to address the current challenges and trends which is affecting <clears throat> agriculture in Africa. And our hope and our vision is to support Africa, basically to fulfill its aspirations, building resilient and sustainable food systems through catalyzing knowledge sharing with African farmers and enabling food, nutrition, income security in their communities. We may not be that big, but through partnerships, what we do is to help catalyze the knowledge sharing with African farmers. And the strategic focus areas that we have in the next five years to be dealing with sustainable, resilient, and regenerative agriculture 
response to soil degradation and climate change, so as to be able to generate surplus, improve productivity, generate surplus, and be able to increase income. Then the next nutrition sensitive agriculture, market oriented agriculture, and tying all this together through a strategic approach where we'll engage in partnership with many different organizations, including Harvest Plus, to be engaged in knowledge generation, knowledge packaging, knowledge transfer and adoption. And then we have cross cutting issues, which cuts across to help build in, in that. Next. <clears throat> Well, if we look at some of these uh, agriculture-based community nutrition improvement approaches which we've been carrying out, what we do basically we started promoting <clears throat> by fortified and nutrient-dense crops to help increase food purchasing power through market-oriented agriculture based and focused on sustainable intensification through regenerative agriculture. Next. Well, next, our aim is to ensure that everything we do helps be able to fit together in a virtuous circle of all those three strategic pillars of the strategy where we have regenerative agriculture at the center. And through enhancing this approach, be able to put in integrated soil fertility management to increase crop productivity, and, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and food security in the process. And our aim is sustainable productivity enhancement. Aim is to be able to generate surplus, engage in uh, cost reduction, be able to increase revenue from product aggregation and collective marketing to be able to have an increase in income security. Now we go from the right to the left that will increase farmers purchasing, purchasing power be able to purchase, you know, inputs that they need, and other aspects of foods, which be able to bring in nutrition security. The aim is to diversify the cropping system so that farmers can have more access to nutrient dense crops, including biofortified crops. And the crop diversification is tied together the promotion of food safety to be able to improve the nutritional value, especially micronutrients of different crop varieties. So all this is tied together, looking at it from a gender sensitive lens to ensure that women, youth, and people with disabilities benefit from this. The aim is to promote by fortified crops and also to increase the food purchasing power. Next. A nutrition sensitive intervention engage in the promotion of biofortified and nutrient dense crops, basically enhancing the production and consumption of these nutritious foods through diet diversification. We are engaged in a very niche area for service handling and agro-processing services to help improve quality and where engage in a lot of uh, agro-processing uh, services, you know, as I mentioned in the next few slides. And all this is tied together to gender sensitive nutrition approaches. So we make women, youths, and other aspects of gender areas aware of nutrition, be able to promote that field. Next. Um, Mel, just to let you know, we're running a little behind. So if you could in, have about three more minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. In Asha, our post harvest honey agro processing services is aimed to improve quality and we've introduced all kinds of post harvest machinery for agro-processing services, improve quality and be able to add value to the food to be able to generate income for all these farmers with whom we work. Next. We also engage in market-oriented agriculture interventions, which is tied together so the farmers with whom we work we promote farming as a business enterprise, promoting collective marketing through farmer cooperatives and smallholder horticulture empowerment promotion approach. SHEP, in partnership with JICA, ensure that farmers have increased income and better access to nutrient dense crops. Next. <clears throat> We 
Lastly, all these are done through the integrated extension models along the entire value chain. We work through along the entire value chain from input to consumption to ensure that all our approaches and tools addresses each and every node in the agriculture sector to touch on farmers' lives in every single sector. Next. <clears throat> The journey has been long and we've been able to develop private service provision <clears throat> whereby we've been engaged in reducing labor intensity and high post harvest losses where we reach farmers in their own homesteads through all these agro processing machinery and we've developed this in partnership with engineering companies to keep on improving them so that crops are processed timely so that we can have improved food safety and quality. Next. <clears throat> also engage youth, women, and people with disabilities in everything that we do, from agro-processing enterprises to e-extension services, seed multiplication, seed fabrication, and maintenance. Next. Lastly, we everything that we've been doing over the years, our aim is to scale up technologies by ensuring that all these agriculture technologies which exists are put in the hands of farmers at the grassroots level. We are developing a digital transformation platform called e-extension platform, looking at the short, medium, and long-term solutions where we have embedded ICT approaches to strengthen the supply chain and to ensure that integrate youth into agriculture through their power of innovation and establishing e-learning platforms in agriculture universities to improve the skills of agriculture extension agents and progressive farmers at all levels in Africa. Next. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. And we are always looking to keep on working with farmers. We work with farmers. That's our new mantra, where all decisions are made in a participatory manner to ensure that everything that we do, all the technologies we introduce, are adopted and scaled up for the benefit of farmers. And we look at opportunities to generate more funding for scaling up by fortification and nutrient dense technologies and capacity building of champions to ensure that all these high nutrient crops reach the hands of farmers at the grassroots level in all these countries where we work in Africa. Thank you very much and we'll continue working with the farmers. Thank you very much, Mel. And I think you underlined very well um, the integrated approach and the value chain approach, which obviously Harvest Plus also shares. And we are very much looking forward to working even more, uh, more generally with uh, SAA on this to expand that reach in, in throughout Africa. Um, so now at this point, we are going to switch to our panel discussion. Uh, I just want to make sure that all the panelists are there and available. Great, fantastic. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about sort of get down into the nuts and bolts of you know how do how do we go about um, expanding the reach um, and the impact of, of biofortification. And I will briefly introduce uh, our panelists, and then we're gonna go one by one, and each is gonna give a. A quick uh, initial remarks, and then we're going to start into the Q and A discussion. Um, so, one of our panelists is Donald Mavendidze. He's the regional director for Africa for Harvest Plus. Um, he's a Zimbabwe national with more more than 20 years' experience in the agriculture sector, and he previously worked um, for Monsanto for more than 16 years, where he held various positions in different locations in in Africa. Uh, we also have Shinjiro Amameshe, who's the Deputy Director General and Group Director for Agriculture and Rural Development for Africa, Middle East, and Europe in the Economic Development part of the Department of JICA. Um, and he has, uh, he's going to be joining us as well. Uh, we have Sani Miko, who is the Nigeria Country Director for the Sasakawa Africa Association. And we are very honored to have Her Excellency Martha Udom Emmanuel, who is the, um, she is the wife of the governor of Akwaibom State in Nigeria, um, but she is also a, an accomplished um, 
uh, activist, if you will, in uh, youth and, and gender uh, in, in, in uh, Nigeria and elsewhere. She is the founder of the non-governmental organization, the Family Empowerment and Youth Reorientation Path Initiative, or FARUP. Uh, so I wanted to welcome all of our panelists. And I think we'll start with uh, Donald um, to give us a little bit of an overview of the status of biofortification in Africa and what kind of efforts are being made to help advance it and scale it up. Please go ahead, Donald. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are listening from. I hope you can all hear me. Peter, just confirm that um, I'm loud and clear. Good, you're good. Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me very great pleasure to be part of this discussion and to be able to share some of our experiences here in Africa as Harvest Plus. I, I want to uh, begin by giving a brief overview of our work uh, that we've been doing here in Africa as Harvest Plus. Uh, you know, for the past decade, as, uh, as already uh, been outlined, Harvest Plus has been working on biofortification with various partners to complement other interventions such as uh, industrial food fortification, uh, supplementation uh, in the fight against uh, hidden hunger. We have uh, targeted uh, the traditional uh, uh, and popular staples because they are the most affordable food group for most communities. And generally in Africa, people eat what they grow. So working with various uh, partners, uh, we have been quite successful. And since 2004, Harvest Plus has supported the release of more than 200 varieties of biofortified crops in 15 countries in Africa alone. The varieties that have been uh, released include those rich in vitamin A, namely maize, uh, cassava, and sweet potato, and those uh, rich in uh, iron, and namely uh, beans and pearl millet. Uh, I should say that research is still ongoing and is at an advanced stage to release crops high in zinc, such as rice and maize. Uh, and we are very excited about this, this work that is ongoing as you, because as you know, rice is a major staple that continues to grow in, in popularity on the continent. And this is coupled by the fact that uh, uh, zinc, defici zinc deficiency is also a major problem. Uh, a number of years ago, Harvest Plus began the work of scaling uh, this innovation called biofortification. And to date, we estimate that more than 6.5 million households are growing these, uh, these biofortified crops in more than and, and more than 32 million people are benefiting in Africa. We are just at the beginning of this scaling phase. And uh, we know that we've got a very long way to go because the problem of malnutrition in, in Africa is dire. It is said that nearly three quarters of, uh, of Africans cannot afford, can't afford a healthy diet. And more than 50% 50, 50 uh, can't afford a nutrient adequate diet. And we believe that biofortification can make a significant contribution in mitigating this problem. To achieve the scale, we realized that we needed to follow a value chain approach as Peter was outlining. Um, and, uh, and we needed to crowd in different types of partners, which are both private and public, and so that we could create a long-term sustainability uh, through this work. And, and so through, our strategy of catalyzing scale, we, we work to ensure that uh, there is adequate supply of uh, quality seed and planting material. And for example, in Malawi, working with the national program, this has led to the release of 10 varieties of vitamin A maize, three varieties of high iron bean, and eight uh, varieties of sweet potato. And also in Malawi, We've also uh, we've been working with uh, private and public uh, systems to facilitate availability of early generation seed to various companies so that uh, we can make biofortified varieties available more, more widely available to the farming families. As you know, as you might probably be aware, early generation seed uh, availability is, is a big problem, and we have been working to solve that uh, that problem in Malawi. 
The second pillar in our strategy is to stimulate demand along the whole value chain using a combination of commercial and social models depending on the co context. And I can just give you an example. Uh, we have been working on a project to commercialize high iron bean, vitamin A, maize, and cassava, vitamin A, cassava uh, value chains in Nigeria, Kenya, and Tanzania, where we are working with various communities and, co and commercial enterprises to raise awareness and interest in these biofortified crops. The third pillar in our strategy in advancing and enabling environment uh, is uh, in making sure that we create that uh, environment that advances this um, uh, enabling environment. We have been advocating uh, for the inclusion of biofortification in policies, uh, programs, budgets at country level, at regional level, and even at continental level. And I, just to give an example, this has led to the inclusion of vitamin A maize in the government in, in uh, the government of Zambia's input subsidy program. And uh, another example is in Zimbabwe, uh, where biofortification has been incorporated as a major component in, uh, in the government's food fortification strategy. Our fourth and final pillar is that we see ourselves as a thought leader. And in this area, in, the, in this area of biofortification, and we work to marshal evidence and support independent research in nutritional impact, adoption, and cost effectiveness. We convene experts and stakeholders to share knowledge, uh, lessons, and lessons and know-how in the area of biofortification. And for example, uh, in Uganda, we have set up a biofortification technical working group together with the Minister of Agri Agriculture. And this is a platform that consists of a cross-section of uh, stakeholders uh, coming from public, private, and even academia, which meets regularly to deliberate and explore ways of continuing to advance uh, this technology in Uganda. And uh, we, I should say we also have similar platforms in, in most other countries. Uh, I'll, uh, Peter, I think I'll stop uh, here and uh, I'm looking really, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, the questions and discussions to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I think you really underlined again the importance of the uh, vibrant value chain to really make it worthwhile, not only for farmers, uh, but also for others that are active in the value chain to really invest in, in biofortification. One quick question that came in is, you know, from the consumer side, uh, what do you think is the most important factor uh, when people, to attract people to biofortified crops and foods? Is it raising awareness about nutrition? Is it a price issue? Is it the taste of the, of the crops and foods? What do you think are kind of the key elements in, in a nutshell, very quickly? Okay, so in a nutshell, Peter, the, the most important element is raising awareness, uh, making sure that consumers are aware of the nutritional value of the crops, of these biofortified crops. And in most instances, it's just a matter of substituting a non-biofortified uh, uh, in uh, maize for instance with biofortified maize and it's the same ingredient but just raising the awareness is the most critical that we have uh, we have seen in our experience at other space excellent thanks again um and we're gonna we're gonna delve into this a little more deeply on the nigeria side um with mr miko and madame emmanuel um to try to get the ground level view about how we can really um sort of energize interest in biofortification but first, I'm going to give Mr. Hamameshi a chance to speak and talk about uh, what what Jika is do doing in Africa uh, to try to promote um, better agricultural uh, practices and the way that uh, nutrition nutrition sensitive agriculture may fit into that. Please go ahead, Mr. Hamameshi. Um, so thank you very much for giving me opportunities to talk about what Jika is doing on nutrition. Um, the uh, JEC is putting the highest importance on nutrition, and JEC has prioritized contribution to human security. Human security is a concept. The, all individuals are entitled to freedom from fear and freedom to live in dignity. And nutrition is the basis of a human life and health. And nutrition is a close link to human security. Therefore, JEC is very keen to promote nutrition improvement. All in individuals must be released from under nutrition. 
And in the context of the nutrition improvement, Africa is a priority region because the number of the people who are suffering from undernutrition is increasing. And it is projected that, it is projected that the, the Africa will overtake Asia and Africa becomes the, 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 the region which has the biggest number of the, uh, undernutrition in the near future. JICA, in collaboration with the African Union Development Agency, it is called All the NEPAT, launched a nutrition initiative called Initiative for Food and Nutrition Security in Africa. It is called IFNA, I-F-N-A. And IFNA is a 10-year initiative starting from 2016. And it aims at establishing a framework of collaboration to accelerate the implementation of the food and nutrition security policies for upscaling action on nutrition on the ground in all African countries. Uh, we are currently at the halfway point and the latter half has just started. And I know that today's topic is biofortified crop. To be honest, JICA has not delivered biofortified crop, but we are also, uh, we also recognize the importance of nutrient, nutrient, how important it is, yes. The activities JICA is currently eager to promote to ITNA is nutrient focused approach, NFA, NFA. In African countries, probably everybody is aware that there are a lot of people who are lacking in the intake of necessary nutrient. And there is a gap between recommended intake of nutrient and actual intake. So, so um, um, there is a tendency that in particular among the poor people, they are too much dependent on the starch and carbohydrate rather than the nutrient, uh, such as vitamin A and iron and zinc. So these are the reasons why JICA, uh, JICA is promoting nutrient-focused approach. In this approach, as a first step, we diagnose the nutrition, nutrient situation and assess a local nutrient gap. We analyze which nutrients are lacking from the household dish. Then compared with the ideal nutrition intake, we recommend what foods are expected to be consumed more from the nutrient aspect. In case that they are farmers are taking into account the specific nutrients they need to consume, and the, and the agriculture environment and the present and the present uh, cropping schedule, we recommend what crop should be produced and when. For example, so they are lacking in the vitamin A. Uh, uh, we might recommend tomato is uh, best crop uh, for production because tomato contains a lot of uh, lycopene. It's vitamin A. We have developed a special application on a nutrient forecast approach, which is which is available for computer, tablet, and smartphone as well. The application is expected to be utilized by field workers in some countries. Jack has already started promoting the nutrient forecast approach by using application, uh, for example, in uh, in Rwanda and in Ethiopia. The activities are about to start in collaboration with UNICEF. Um, yes, um, uh, this application is available for everybody. So, so if uh, uh, there is a person uh, who are interested, yes, uh, I, 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 I'd like to share with you. And um, anyway, so the uh, working barrier, uh, the working barrier among the uh, Harvest Plus, Sasakawa Africa Association, and Jack is very close. All three organizations are focusing on nutrient. And I'd like to explore the possibility to work together at, at the same site and at the same country uh, to uh, uh, tackle against the nutrient gap on the ground. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounds like uh, Jika is, is, has a very comprehensive and impressive program to try to address nutrition in Africa and elsewhere. And it sounds like, even though you're not already working with biofortified crops, it sounds like they could play a, a, a role in, in helping you achieve your objectives. So uh, it would be a great topic of conversation. Um, now let's try to let's try to bring it more into the case study realm and really talk about you know how, what this all means for for a country in Africa. And as I mentioned before, we're really focusing as the example of Nigeria, uh, the largest population country in, on the continent. Um, we are going to switch over that way now, and I think I want to start with uh, Madame Emmanuel um, to talk a little bit about 
uh, from your experience in your state, in Aquivome State, tell us a little bit about what the what the nutrition challenges are there, what you've experienced working with people on the ground through your through your NGO and, and otherwise through the government channels, um, and what how this might connect to to what's happening on the ground and 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 the kind of nutrition challenges we're facing. And where where staple crops, where more, more nutritious staple crops might play a role, um, and I'm thinking particularly, you know, the smallholder farmer, in specifically uh, women and children within those families as well. Please go ahead, Madam. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Morning, evening, wherever you're hearing from. And um, let me first of all thank the president of SSA and all the organizers of this program for inviting me to be part of this uh, great conversation. Yes, um, as a nutrition champion that I was made in my state, I know that nutrition is a critical pathway of health and development to everyone, the child, the baby, and the adults. Nutrition also is good um, in building immunity stronger immunity in human beings is also serves as a source of longevity that's about good nutrition so in the absence of good nutrition what happens in my state for instance i was made a champion of nutrition and we realized that um, somehow lack of knowledge about how to go about getting good nutrition from rural people. When I came on board, we started a campaign sensitization, especially on biofortified crops. I want to thank Harvest Plus. They have been of great help to us in the state by introducing biofortified crops like cassava, vitamin A in cassava, vitamin A in maize, and sweet potato. Now, how do we get the people to accept this? We have to lecture them. The initiative by the state government, carried out by the state government, is to distribute these biofortified crops to all local farmers in the state. Not just distribution, we have to attach trained people, trainers to train them how to make use of their fortified uh, crops and stems given to them. Apart from the crops, there are value chains. There are different ways you can process the biofortified crops that can be helpful even to babies and small children. And this has been done by the state government, setting up processing machines that will help in processing of the the biofortified crops to different varieties that can be consumed by our rural women. Talking about the biofortified crops, it goes a long way to help because it's not everybody, especially the rural women that have money to buy supplements, especially vitamin A supplements. They can't afford it. So making sure that they key into planting biofortified crops has really helped in terms of nutrition, curbing the menace of malnutrition, the malfunction of um, the micro, micronutrient that's supposed to get. So the state government initiative is to distribute the crops and the stems free of charge to all local farmers. They also train on capacity building. Who are the people to be trained, our youths, the women, those are the people that are the forefront in agriculture. When we had um, if, um, we had nutrition, nutritious food fair last year in my state, courtesy of Harvest Plus, then they will showcase so many varieties of uh, food that can be produced from biofortified crops and we had to tell our people you can key into this you can use this in your homes they are cost effective they are not expensive especially 
like um, vitamin A, cassava vitamin A, they process it to various variety of products. Apart from the stable gari that we made from it, I hope you know what gari is. That's our, one of our stable food. We process it into different things. They can make it in form of cereal. The same with vitamin A maize. So the initiative is very, very welcome. The state government has hit into it. For the past 10 years, they've introduced by fortified crops in the state. And we are still looking for more. The challenge is the availability of these stems and crops, which I believe at the end of this meeting, they will look into it, making it available. Because it's not about sensitization. When you sensitize people and they buy into it, the next action is where can we get this product? Where can we get the stem? Where can we get the crops? So my coming on board is to sensitize women. In my own NGO, every quarter I gather women, especially pregnant women, because you are what you eat. That I believe. If you take in healthy food, the child that will come forth will be healthy. So we need to train, especially pregnant women, you need to buy into eating by fortified crops instead of going to for supplement because they can never afford it. So what we do is we gather them every quarter, we teach them nutrition aspect of it, the health aspect of their lives, how to balance your nutrition, how to eat well, where to go to when you are sick, all this is what we are doing, I am doing as a governor's wife and with my NGO. Just last week, I was sponsored by Vitamins Angel. They gave us some multivitamins, especially vitamin A to give to children in the state. But that's not enough because how many people can afford that? If I'm not able to give vitamin A, what can they resort to? Buy fortified crops, which will replace what they could have bought with money. So I really believe um, with continuous sensitization and implementation and provision of those crops and stand by fortified crops to the people, it will help to eliminate hunger and poor nutrition, malnutrition, especially kwashoko in the lives of our children and all that. So I want to thank the development partners also that we are very much open. The state government is open. We are still pushing. The government is very, very much interested in the nutrition of our people. They are doing everything possible. Like the next planting season that is coming, government is going to distribute crops, uh, stems, and seeds free to farmers across the states. That's what the Kwaibom state government is doing. And I believe that's what Nigerian government as from national is also doing. But I'm speaking for my state because I know that's what we are doing. We are trying to eradicate poverty. And we are saying to everybody, you must go back to farming. And you don't just farm. You don't just plant. You must plant improved variety crops and stems. That's what we are doing in the state. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam Emmanuel. That was, that was incredibly inspiring. And... Um... We can see why you're such an effective champion for biofortification because you really made the case very well. I think you underlined as well maybe a point that we haven't made as, as well as we should, which is that biofortified crops and foods are particularly geared toward those who are most vulnerable nutritionally, that is to say young children and women, particularly women of reproductive age. Um, yeah. And that the crops, by the way, are actually bred with nutrition targets for those to meet the needs of those particular groups and so we think it's wonderful that you are you know trying to promote that both as part of the government and as part of your ngo and donald just noting what she said there about you know maybe we need more supply there in, in nigeria of, yeah. of stems yeah. <laughs> so we'll just we'll yeah. just note that down as we go forward um, but but thank you so much i wanted to ask you one quick question um, what, what, is, what is the most challenging thing that you face when you're trying to convince uh, smallholder families to, to adopt uh, biofortified crops? What is the, the big resistance that you get and the thing that we need to take, in, take into account? Yeah, um, the resistance we get is because they are not used to that kind of 
crops or that's what we are bringing to them, they find it difficult to buy into it. They are not sure whether what they will get will be okay. So to convince them, you, a trial will come, will give them some samples. Okay, you go and try it. If you like it, come back uh, for more. So the resistance we get at first is rejection. They don't, they don't want to. They have been used to what they have been planting. This is a new thing. We don't know how it's gonna be. But when they will give them samples, go and try. When they get, when they try it and say that it's good for them, then they now uh, come back to us. So the most thing is that resistance. Then another challenge, another challenge is uh, the culture of, uh, how do I even put it? Where um, non-availability, not culture, non-availability, of these uh, crops. Those are the two major uh, challenge, challenges that we have. Non-availability of the crops and the culture of rejection at first time. Great, thank you very much again. Um, I'm gonna to turn to, to Sunny Miko now, um, just to talk a little bit about what we're already doing actually in Nigeria with SAA, I believe we've already been um, collaborating and maybe you can just talk a little bit about how we're trying to promote biofortification in Nigeria more generally. Uh, um, thank you, Peter, and uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, my job uh, today is to be able to showcase how SA in Nigeria uh, is able to mainstream the SAA organizational strategic focus, especially nutrition sensitive agriculture into our national activities. First of all, I will give some background information. Nigeria is ranked as the, as the second uh, country in the global ranking of stenting prevalence out of 136 countries. And out of the 58.8 million uh, stunted children, as mentioned by President Obasan, 11 million of such children are in Nigeria. And uh, this is caused by extreme poverty and poor diet intake. And we also noted that out of every uh, five child, uh, children, you have about uh, one of them is malnourished. And about 29% of all from school age children are vitamin A deficient. And in every three pregnant women, two have iron deficiency uh, anemia. Uh, we also have a record maternal uh, mortality is among the highest in the world in Nigeria and contributes to about 20% of global maternal death. And uh, nutrition has now been placed at the core of SA strategic shift for critical development. And this is in line with the current focus of Nigerian government. And the global uh, uh, strategic focus SA has evolved to align its intervention strategy to contribute to global efforts to sustainable development goals specifically SD2, SDD, uh, SD, SDG2, uh, that is to cut out, uh, you know, hunger in all its forms. Therefore, SAA Nigeria conducted a nutrition needs assessment to identify the gaps that are in the pre and post harvest of sectors of the value chains uh, so that we can improve the HDDS country. We also try to mainstream into our extension activities, demonstrations and promotion of biofortified materials through our collaboration with Harvest Plus. We receive some quantities of certified seeds from bio, uh, of biocertified vitamin A and cassava, maize and cassava, iron and zinc fair millets, as well as uh, zinc rice. Uh, through the farmer learning plan, from these materials were deployed into our demonstrations in four key states in the northwestern Nigeria and north central, because these states are the major areas where you have high stunting of children under five. These states are Kano, Jigao, Gombe, and Nasrao State. And we are able to establish about 13 community demo plots on biofortified cassava. We also had seven uh, 
community development plots on uh, iron and zinc permalite, and a total of 57 uh, community de demonstration plots on maize. And we also established uh, four hectares of community seed uh, to increase the quantity of biofortified uh, maize uh, variety within the society. The demonstrations were established to showcase good agronomic practices, pre and post harvest handling practices, while our community based seed multiplication were meant to produce more uh, seeds for wider adaptation within the community. We always try to source, verify, adapt, and package and promote appropriate value adding post harvest handling, processing, and storage technology options to improve grain quality and Response harvest losses and to increase economic activity. We carry out gender and nutrition sensitization campaign programs through radios, dramas, and videos, and also produce printed manuals and flyers and posters to be able to educate the public. We were also able to form and support nutrition promotion partners forum to discuss and promote biofortified crop production, trade, and consumption. Our program also support women and youth groups to establish agro-processing enterprise centers around established farmer learning platforms in order to add value to uh, biofortified materials, especially zinc rice and uh, pro-vitamin A, maize, and cassava. SA in Nigeria also promotes complementary food preparation and consumption, local balanced diets for adults and children through the training of about 180 Officers under the co nephon funded programs and additional 625 extension agents under extra co activities where women and youth groups were trained on food recipes and fortifications. We were able also to strengthen the capacity of 635 extension agents who had been trained to be able to improve and cascade information improve and uh, biofortified crop production in terms of trade, value addition, also consumption to address malnutrition and income generation. These extension agents were able to step down this training to additional 32,200 farmers within this year. And they were able to introduce and promote production of biofortified crops through preparation of a variety of local balanced diets. We were all able to have popular discussions on radio uh, programs that is being carried out weekly in order to educate the public on how to reduce child stunting through preparation and consumption of nutritious food using biofortified uh, crops. We were also able to discuss on how best we can reduce food uh, wastages and losses by uh, training women, uh, especially at the rural areas, how to handle crops after harvesting. And finally, we are able to educate farmers on improved methods of grain handling and storage because these biofortified crops are very delicate in terms of handling and uh, storage. And all this we are trying to do to promote uh, the use of biofortified crops. And currently, we are discussing, discussing with uh, uh, Harvest Plus to get additional uh, seeds on uh, zinc rice, additional quantity of uh, uh, orange flesh uh, sweet potato, and also uh, pro vitamin A maize that uh, is in serious demand in, in all the locations where we operate. We have been also able to put a program or radio on how to consume, how to change the perception of consumers, because we discovered consumer preference in terms of the consumption of white versus yellow maize. Uh, this is what we discovered in uh, national state. The majority of farmers or consumers prefer the white one, but we have a program now that uh, to educate uh, uh, farmers on the consumption of the yellow uh, for vitamins uh, A maize. We are also trying to convince farmers because production of the biofortified maize 
and the, the ordinary maize, they discovered there is no uh, any pricing difference in the market. And so most of the time they are questioning why should they go into production of something that will not increase income into their pockets. So, so our Sonny, we're, we're, we're running a little bit yeah. late. So just wrap finally, up. Our, our discussion is now trying to educate the pub, uh, public on how best to uh, consume, produce, consume, and also get involved in uh, business deals on biofortified crops. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop here. Excellent. Just amazing work that's going on in Nigeria. Um, very quickly, uh, because we are very, very short on time, and we need to get to our next section. But I want to ask, uh, um, first I want to ask Sonny and Donald very quickly, you have one minute to respond. <laughs> What's, what, and, and given that uh, Madame Emanuel is here as well, this is a great opportunity for dialogue. Um, what do you see as the priorities from the government side to help uh, promote uh, biofortified crops in, in Nigeria? Uh, and elsewhere as well, but um, what do you see as the most important things that the government can do to to help support uh, this effort? Donald, you want to start? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think for me, there are two uh, strategies really uh, to promote the biofortification. One is more short term, uh, like immediate. That's something that can be done and uh, uh, kind of, uh, the governor's wife just uh, articulated it well that is inclusion of uh, planting material be it seeds be it cassava stems into uh, government programs seed relief programs or seed distribution program that's like short term but i think the most uh, effective way would be to incorporate biofortification and biofortification biofortification strategies into policies and programs um, of the government and actually translate uh, that policy inclusion into actual investments that uh, the government can make to ensure that biofortification becomes an integral part of the strategy that I, they have to mitigate against micronutrient poor nutrition. So I would say those are the, for me, the two most important strategies that governments can engage. Thank you. Uh, Sonny, do you want to add anything to that very quickly? Vic, you're, you're muted. Just to add uh, what Donald has said, uh, I think one key area is publicity. The government needs to go into uh, educating the public on the use and the need and the importance of biofortification and also get into investing in a seed system that will uh, vigorously replace the normal uh, seed we, we have in, in, in the market. We've done it under the quality protein maize. We created what we call Q QPM villages, and we you know, significantly went in to replace the normal maize with the QPM. And in those villages, you will never see any ordinary uh, maize except the QPM, and it really works. So we need to invest in seed system that will quickly replace the local and the ordinary seeds we have, and also go into serious publicity to educate the public on the need for biofortification and consumption of biofortified crops. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Emmanuel, anything you want to say in response uh, that you would like the biofortification partners to be doing more uh, to help in Nigeria, to give you the counterpoint <laughs> on this? Yeah. Um, I would like um, more collaboration um, in terms of supplying of what we need these seeds and the stems, the biofortified seeds that will help us a lot in the states. So that's what we want. We want more Great. support. Thank you very much. And Mr. Amandese, I hope we've uh, convinced you that uh, biofortification is the is the way to go. Do you have any uh, any thoughts about what you've heard so far on the, on the panel or any particular questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Yes, yes. Uh, from a broader aspect, yes, yes, yes. Um, the uh, biofortification is a, a part of the uh, nutrition improvement. Yes, um, the, I, would, I, I totally agree with the, the, the first speaker. So he, uh, 
Uh, he, he emphasized the, 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 uh, the, the uh, policy inclusion, yes. The policy inclusion and resource mobilization, uh, these are the very important. So in order to realize that, yes, awareness raising, awareness raising for nutrition, uh, these are the very important. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. This has been a great discussion. Um, and now we're going to move to our final concluding remarks. Uh, our first uh, speaker is going to be uh, Makato Kitanaka, who's the president of the Sasakawa Africa Association. Uh, Mr. Kitanaka, are you there? Yes. Great. Thank you Please very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the participants for your uh, participation to the today's event. I believe all the participants understand well what is the biofortified crops and its importance. Sasakawa Africa Association, SAA, launched the new strategy plan this year for five years, which covers three pillars. The first pillar is promotion of regenerative agriculture. The second is the promotion of nutrition sensitive agriculture. And the third is promotion of market-oriented agriculture. In our new strategy plan, we will put more emphasis on improving nutrition in rural Africa. The partnership with Harvest Plus is a very good opportunity to in integrate biofortified crops into SA nutrition-sensitive agriculture approaches and to help expand the production and consumption of biofortified crops in Africa based on our 35 year experiences in agriculture extension and advisory service in Africa. Now, I would like to show you our approaches of co collaboration with Harvest Press and SAA. We divided into three groups of countries. Tier one countries covers Uganda and Nigeria, where both organizations have already uh, started the collaboration and we have our own offices. Tier two countries cover Zambia, Malawi, Ethiopia, Mali, Kenya, DR Congo, and Zimbabwe. SOA has its own office in Ethiopia and Mali, but we don't have in other countries where Harvest Press have their offices. We'll collaborate in these countries by sending experts with each other from neighbor countries and virtually. Tier 3 covers eight countries where both sides has no offices. We are going to expand our collaboration based on the experiences of Tier 1 and Tier 2 countries. Our collaboration covers from the supply of biofortified seeds to the selling of the product, product to the market along with agricultural and nutritious value chain, expanding public and private partnerships. We also work together on policy advocacy and resource mobilization, organizing international and regional seminars and workshops in the continent. Next slides show you the focus biofortified crops in our collaboration. I am rich varieties of beans and pearl millet, vitamin A rich varieties of maize, cassava, and sweet potatoes, and high zinc rich rice. These micronutrients are highly required in the dairy diets in respective countries. Dear participants, 
I explained the partnership of Harvard Plus and SAS to expand the reach and the impact of nutrient enriched staple crops in Africa, but only Harvard Plus and SAA could not cover everything. We'd like to build a future platform of biophotic crop crops in Africa with your kind participations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kitanaka. Um, and of course, we are, we're very excited about the partnership. By the way, um, for those attending, uh, there should be a link that will be put in the chat for an announcement about the partnership. Our final uh, speaker in the concluding remarks is Arun Baral, who's the CEO of Harvest Plus. Please go ahead, Arun. Thank you, um, Peter, and thank you, um, uh, Kitanaka-san and all the participants. It was great for me to listen in and hear everybody. And my job is a lot more easier now because uh, some of the things I wanted to emphasize have been very eloquently um, shared by the participants. So thanks for that. So if you go to the next chart, I just want to cover a few things, uh, you know, around Harvest Plus strategy. Um, our strategy is basically based on four pillars. And, you know, the, the pillars that you see here, obviously we need to make sure that biofortified crops are included in the global and national breeding programs. Because like how do you said, product is the king. And if we have good products, the adoption of these products will go like wildfire. And currently the product portfolio is good, but we need to make sure that it stays strong for the future. So um, mainstreaming, which is just like fluoride in the water, is the concept where nutrition should be embedded, nutritional traits should be embedded in these crops, and these crops should be high yielding, good quality, so the adoption improves. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is around facilitating partnerships that really strengthen the seed and the food value chains then that benefit the smallholder farmers. <clears throat> so this is very, very important. Like Kitanaka san said, Harvest Plus, Sasakawa, Jaika, we need more of these people. We need more people to be involved, you know, people from private sector, public sector, the governments, the donors, because the opportunity for this technology is significant. Now, biofortification is a complementary technology uh, along with supplementation, fortification, dietary diversity. But if you can just switch the staples from the current, you know, to biofortified, you know, a lot of the problem will be solved. And, and, and for that, we need partners from multiple spectrums. So that's the second pillar. The third pillar is really enabling environment. And we have talked about the role of policy, the role of programs, the role of regulations, if they are tilted towards biofortification, nutrition sensitive agriculture. And then the governments also back those policies by their own budgetary allocations, because we do need investments in these crops. Um, then we can really start to see the creation of more nutritious food systems, more resilient food systems that are more targeted, the most vulnerable, particularly the women and the children. So enabling an environment is very, very critical. And then expanding the, uh, you know, the knowledge base, the evidence base, and sharing this knowledge. So our partnership, for example, with Sasakawa, with such a great reputation on extension, their reach, their ability to you know, share knowledge, um, Mel talked about using e-learning, et cetera. All those things come together to make sure that we make farmer, smallholder farmer, and the most vulnerable people successful. And that is basically access to nutrition. So, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what we're trying to solve is 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet, 3 billion. So out of the 7 billion people that we have on this planet, Three billion cannot. And, and in today's day and age, you know, where we're sending people to the moon and the Mars, we can't solve a very simple hunger and a nutrition, you know, crisis. That is 
exacerbated by COVID-19, by climate, by conflict. So we do need to come together and, and try to sort of really, you know, overcome this uh, hidden hunger, the malnutrition challenge that we have. If you go to the next slide here, I just want to say that, you know, today all the distinguished speakers and panelists made a strong case for biofortification and addressing um, malnutrition. I thank you for that. Uh, biofortified crops can significantly improve the re resilience of the food systems and vulnerable people, especially the women and children. Tomorrow, global decision makers are going to gather for the landmark nutrition and growth summit. Um, and it is very, very important that you know we urge the donors, the governments and the private sector and the civil society actors to please come together and make new commitments to address malnutrition. Um, organizations like Sasakawa, JICA and others are key to you know, start this journey with us. And we look forward to making these food systems uh, more resilient and more uh, nutritious with the help of all of you. So I'll stop here. Uh, Peter, I don't want to go over the time, uh, but thank you very much. I really look forward to everybody's participation in this journey to address hidden hunger and eradicate malnutrition. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Arun. And thanks to all of our speakers and panelists. This was a fascinating discussion and I hope uh, we've made the strong case uh, that biofortification should play a key role in global and national and regional efforts to address malnutrition, particularly micronutrient malnutrition among uh, rural communities in particular. Um, I just also wanted to thank everyone who attended uh, just to let you know that we will be emailing you, those who registered, uh, the uh, link to the recording of this session, as well as a link to all of the uh, slide presentations that were given by some of the speakers. So I want to thank everyone again, and uh, we look forward to this exciting collaboration as well between Harvest Plus and the Sasakawa Africa Association. I want to thank all of our distinguished speakers, Ms. Emmanuel, um, President Obasanjo um, and Mr. Uh, Sasakawa as well. And we wish everybody good luck and we look forward to the food, this Nutrition for Growth Summit tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.